a chance you'll be able to catch up and figure out if you missed something. Um, so this is kind of the big <coughs> slide, is sort of the why. So why did we, why did I change this from simply the standard image processing, like getting started, to a more sort of machine learning focus? Um, so it's clearly becoming a more and more important topic. Um, you know, if you read the newspaper or look at scientific articles, it's quite clear machines are becoming ever better at solving problems that humans used to do. And a lot of very exciting tasks exist in sort of the food area. So I know Bueller spends quite a bit of money on machines to sort grains more efficiently. Um, there's a Swiss startup that does, I think, coffee beans. Mm -hmm. and the Florida State Southern. Yeah. Um, there's another one that does waste by ingredient from garbage images. So they have a scale on top of the garbage, and you put it on there, and it will tell you you threw away this many potatoes, this many uh, pieces of bread, this much ketchup, so that restaurants can try to plan better what they're doing. Um, and then there's sort of the whole series of other interesting use cases. And so ten, probably something you're connected to is in one of these tasks, where you can start to automate it. And so I think it's very important to at least understand a little bit and have a framework for understanding these kinds of problems. And so by going through sort of a dummy problem or a realistic enough dummy problem together, you should get a better feeling for what steps are involved and how you can go about, you know, at least initiating a project where machine learning plays a critical role in what you're trying to do. And you know, the impact of AI and automation is quite massive. And I think one of the things that becomes more and more clear is that it's not really, you know, there will be jobs lost but a huge number of jobs will be transformed. So there'll be a lot more people working together with machines and building models and collecting data that are useful for training other models and that the actual doing the raw task itself will be less and less important. Um, so this is something that I found very useful um, and I did not come up with. Um, I think you guys have done business things at the Science Week before. So have you seen this canvas or a canvas like this? So this is an adaptation of sort of the business model canvas for machine learning tasks. So you can find it online at machinelearningcanvas.com. And it's quite useful because it allows you to sort of map out all the different tasks that you have to do without writing any code or doing any complicated modeling or anything else. And so this is really how do you think about your problem and how do you fill out the different fields that are relevant for it. And here, you know, these fields by themselves don't mean very much. But here's now like an example with sort of priority inbox from Google, where they have this filled out. And so that, you know, the first thing you start on is what's your value proposition? You know, what are you trying to do for an end user or yourself in the case of your project? You know, what is the actual goal? Because it's very easy to say, we want to take these pixels and predict bubble size, and it's like, well, that's probably not your value proposition. You probably have something much bigger in mind, and so what is that goal? And then how can you kind of break that down into what's the actual machine learning task? Where can you get data from? How do you collect the data? What features do you use? What decisions are you actually trying to make? What predictions are coming out of your model? How do you evaluate if your model is still working well? And kind of putting everything together. Um, so you can, you can go back to that in more detail. So the project we're doing, um, I'm not sure if you've seen this post from Facebook, is this sort of images to recipe, which is what they call reverse grid. <coughs> and so this data set, they basically have thousands and thousands of images and recipes, and you can take a picture on your phone, and it will tell you the ingredients, and the more advanced ones will even tell you the instructions for how you cook. And so it's a quite cool, you know, idea for a project that, you know, if you see a meal that you like, you can just take a picture and it will tell you how you can make that. And so how we sort of adapt this to what we're looking for is, well, let's say we have this data set. We don't want to do images to recipes because that's a super complicated problem. Um, it's also really not a very well-constrained problem because, you know, if it says preheat oven to 
375 instead of 350? Is that wrong? How wrong is it? And so what we want to do is focus on just a much simpler task of stopping a user from eating food they might be allergic to. And so you could take a picture of food and your app would tell you what allergens it likely contained. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just a remark, because I, I like the Facebook approach, but we have an EKG to have a very interesting approach, which yeah. is collecting data also from a nutritional perspective, which yeah. is, uh, you know, Paul Presser, mm -hmm. who is now, now doing this at the Economics Institute. And this is quite interesting because probably this could be nicely covered because there is information about health-related aspects yeah. of food itself. So it means if you could go for ingredients or recipes and then connect it, yep. even to some nutritional aspects and health outlook, uh, you know, would come from. So maybe this is an interesting task for the future as well because there's a big data collection. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's always one of the most important parts there is that sort of data sources. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one of the things where you'll see companies like Google and Facebook and Amazon tend to be very creative with data collection. And that universities tend to be very manual with data collection. But there's some kinds of data that need to be collected manually. And there's some things where you can use creative tricks, particularly if you have you know, billions of people using your site, that you have access to data that universities would never have access to. That they can form sort of very different <coughs> types of data sets. Um, but yeah, um, so the kind of toy problem we're working with now is this. And at the end, the goal would be is that you can have an app that will tell you what allergens are in your food. And so that's kind of the core value proposition. And one of the things to notice there is you don't, you don't want to be too specific. You want to focus on sort of the core <coughs> tense. And so here we, we don't mention images. That's just one way you could possibly do it. Maybe they type the name of the thing they're eating and you show them possible. But there's a number of different ways you could deliver that value proposition. And you don't want to overly constrain yourself when you're filling out this and also kind of when you're working on projects, the idea is that you could take this table and quite, you know, maybe not quickly, but fill out all of these aspects without knowing anything about the code or the other tasks. And if you start with this, it makes it a lot easier to work with sort of computer science informatic collaborators because now you've sort of organized your thoughts in a reasonable way so that they can start to do something with it. And so, yeah, so the value proposition starts there. The decision is then where we sort of focus down on kind of what is the more specific task. And this would be then sort of take an image and list what allergens might be in it. And so this is now, you know, already taking the decision we want to use images. Maybe there's a better way to do it, but that's for this problem what we're going to look at. And that we want to list out the allergens that are possibly in there. And then for the ML task, Oh, sorry. For the decisions, it's for a given food item, list the allergens. For the ML task, it's take an image and show a list of allergens. For the data sources, this is where sort of companies like Facebook get quite creative, where they said rather than trying to manually create a new data set of all of you know, the recipes and all of these images, we can just go to cooking websites and steal all the pictures that they have and all of the recipes next to them, and we now have paired lists of pictures and recipes. And so now we know exactly what's inside all of these different pictures, and these pictures, you know, if you were to take a picture and try to manually have someone write down the recipe and manually write down <coughs> all the ingredients that were in it, you know, that would probably take you 60 seconds per picture at least. But for these cooking websites, it's already been done. You know, they have people with the final product, and some of the websites even let people upload their own images. And so now you have images that people have uploaded themselves of, you know, 10 different ways you can possibly cook this dish. And so that's one of the, you know, key things is not just the standard ways of, you know, you take an image and manually label it, because that can be quite time consuming, but how can you leverage a lot of the data that's available on the internet in order to solve your problem? So clearly if you're dealing with, you know, 3D tomography data, there's not a lot of data on the internet you can easily leverage to solve your problem. So you have to manually spend three days labeling it yourself. But, or longer, yeah. <laughs> but for a lot of problems where you're dealing with images from iPhones or cameras, there are similar sorts of problems that you can sort of line up with 
that allow you to leverage what other people have already collected. So here we have sort of the first coding part, which is kind of the ingredients overview. Um, so if you click on that link, you should get to this notebook. And everyone has a Kaggle account set up? And so if you're signed into your Kaggle account, you should be able to click in that corner and go copy and edit kernel. I think for you it might show up there. So if you see that, Is it working for people? Or? Copy and edit. Yeah. And so that's basically what we'll be doing with this, is we'll be taking notebooks that I've already written, that already work, and just kind of running through them and trying to understand them and maybe tweaking little things inside of them. And that eventually, when you have more time later, you can go back and try to you know, learn the basics of Python and try to figure out what exactly is happening here. But taking something that already works and tweaking it, or breaking it, is a lot easier than writing everything from scratch. And this is anyways what most people end up doing is they don't start from the very beginning. Um, so the first block, you don't really, so basically the way Kaggle works, or these notebooks work, is you have individual cells, and you sort of want to run them in order. And so you have here a nice play button where you can click to run that cell and then you can go to the next one and click to run that one. And these two are just setting up your environment so they're not doing anything so they don't have any output. But this one actually starts to load the data so if you click that one you see it, it <coughs> outputs a bunch of stuff and that you get the, the data set. So here you have like this little Excel spreadsheet of all of the data or the sample of the data that you've loaded up. But that this is kind of what um, Facebook has scraped from the internet. So you have you know, images, ingredients, instructions, title, everything else for all of these. So has everyone got that little table to show up? So oh, it's downloading. Yeah. So it has to download it the first first time you run it. But it's not downloading to your computer, it's downloading to the machine in the cloud. And if you get an error message, you probably didn't run one of the cells that came before. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that we have, I think the fifth block you get down to, what we do is we take all of the top ingredients from each recipe and put them all together in one giant list and then show how many of each one we have. And so if we go here, open image and new tab. Does that work? Oh. Because that's potentially easier. Turn dark. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
but that you can zoom into this on your machines, it should work fine. And see sort of what the top ingredients of each recipe is. Yeah, which is probably easy enough to guess. Um, but you also see one of the things that's quite important for this is that you have very, very uneven distributions. So you have tons of things with salt, butter, flour, eggs, and then very, very few things with, you know, mayonnaise or fresh parsley or down at the sort of more extreme end of the spectrum, bananas, cheese. Yeah. Um, can you um, can you maybe uh, say something about uh, how to scrape it? So do you what, what, what do you use uh, to, to get the data? Yeah. So what I think Facebook even <coughs> so if we go back. Here, I think in the reverse cooking article. Is there a library that you can use? Uh, there's a few libraries you can use. I think they even have. <coughs> um, So I can add. No, no, I want this. It's a post that I built for that. What? It's just a horrible picture. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of very weird things in this data set. <laughs> um, so I can add this link to it. <laughs> But um, basically, if you look at Fast AI, which is one of the courses I mentioned at the end, this is a very like pragmatically oriented deep learning course, which then I think takes a few weeks to go through. But they have um, this Google Images download command you can install in Python. And then you can basically just say what you want to search for, what size images you want, and how many images you want to download. And it will go through Google Images and download all those images for you. And the annotations come from the same so it saves the image. It saves the image and the link for it. Because then you have to go to the website and reformat. With the annotation in the title, or um, well, it depends on what you're trying to extract from it. So basically, if you were trying to get images of like bananas versus plantains, you just have one folder that had a ton of banana images and another folder that had a ton of plantains images, and so you just have two folders and two searches. But if you wanted to get like recipes, you need to like take that recipe, like try to find the recipe text, and then extract it automatically. Um, which can be really easy, but each cooking website has a slightly different format that they keep the recipes in. So you probably need to be a little bit clever with how you go through that. But for a lot of things, just using Google image search is quite helpful. And you don't have to manually download all the images. It'll download 500 or 4,000 or whatever you want for you. Okay, so sort of the next part is, um, oh, I see. Here. Um, so you can run the rest of this notebook. This one isn't as important, but basically if you keep running all the blocks, you can also click run all to run it from start to finish. But that here you'll see Here's all the different items in the list and how frequently they occur. You see there, you see each row, or sorry, each column represents a different um, cook uh, recipe, and each row represents a different ingredient. And so you see there's some ingredients which are incredibly common and other ones which are just very, very rare. And so now with this, we can actually show what some of those images look like. And you see sort of what the top ingredients in each one of these things is. Just a question, how do you define the top ingredients here? Uh, the top ingredients, I think, were the top 
100 most common <laughs> ingredients in all of them? Just to make the, make the list. list much smaller and easier to deal with. Um, but yeah, you could do another approach for trying to find them. And some of them you can see, this is quite common when you scrape really large data sets, uh, appear to be mislabeled. <laughs> so like the bottom one being orange juice, I guess that could be an ingredient of it, but it seems quite unlikely. It clear, probably consists of something else. So either that image was wrongly linked on this page, or the recipe was incorrectly parsed from what you were doing. And so with all of these things, particularly when you're scraping really large data sets, or you're taking data from other people, you need to do that kind of quality check yourself. And so just kind of resample, take more and more and more images. And then if you go up to this, you can change you know, this to 8 by 8. And then that number here to sample 64 images. And each time you do it, you'll get a different combination of images. But that you can kind of scroll through or randomly sample parts of your data and see if what comes out makes sense. <coughs> you know that for this one, the orange juice appears to be quite reasonable. For some of the other ones, it also looks okay. But you can go through and kind of make sure the quality of your data sets is good. Because if the quality of your data set's bad, then whatever models you build on top of it are also going to be bad. Then when you're done, you can just click commit, and it will run all of your notebooks and save the results. Yeah? You see that there's a lot of mistakes. If you go in your original data and change it, you probably don't do it because you download everything from the previous source. Right. Well, you have to, I mean, so usually what you do, if you find lots of mistakes, you probably want to go back and change your procedure. Mm -hmm for actually collecting the data. So if you see that like half of the images are the wrong labels, it's gonna to be too much work to manually remove half of them. And so you probably want to go back and rework on your process of how are you extracting the recipes? Can you automatically identify the ones that are really completely wrong? And how do you put that together? Um, but basically, you know, if it's just a few ones that are wrong, then what you want, then what you want to have is maybe just remove those rows you know, from your yep. Excel spreadsheet and say these ones aren't good. Or take a group of you know, 200 and check them really perfectly and use that as sort of your validation set. So you know that these ones are labeled perfectly and you'll train on everything, but you'll make sure your model works on these 200 perfectly labeled ones. Is there like a size estimation? Let's say a 4,000 pictures, no. what, how big should be the validation set? Like 10% or? That depends a lot. So we'll get into that a bit okay. more later. Um, but yeah, there's, it's very difficult to say one number that's good for every problem. Okay. Um, but yeah, so that's that notebook. That one's sort of like the, um, the basic introduction. That one's kind of <coughs> getting comfortable with the tools. I don't know why I can't present. So then the next part we go through is ingredients to allergens. Um, so this is now where we take sort of the top ingredients and we match it with the eight most common allergies. And so the eight most common allergies are cow milk, eggs, <coughs> tree nuts, peanuts, shellfish, wheat, soy, fish, according to this website I found. I'm not sure. I assume you guys know that one. Than I do anyways. Um, but then, you know, the task is we have these list of ingredients. How do we match this well to allergies? Um, and can anyone see sort of what the initial problem would be? You know, if we just take all the list of ingredients and match it to those items, do you think that's going to work well? Yeah, so the outlier ones, so of course if you're like super allergic to peanuts and it just contains traces of peanuts, no, it might not show up. Like, like when it says orange juice, you're going to get all that crap all yeah. over here. Yeah, yeah. so all the initial labels that are bad, you'll run into a problem with. But there's something even bigger that you'll run into with these categories. 
Yeah. You will have to, let's say, find that wheat is present in flour. Exactly. So that all of these things are very broad categories. And often when you're cooking, you have very specific things. Like you'll have cream or you'll have, um, you know, tree nuts. I don't know any recipe that says tree nuts in it. They all have specific types of nuts that you put in. And so you have to take these categories and map them to the things that show up in your top ingredients list so that they overlap. Well, questions whether you can go that far down if you go to the monitor phase because <laughs> molecular information about what causes that. Yeah. So, so yeah, so the, the scientific or university approach to this would then be much more of we cook all these meals and do a molecular analysis and then we have the real labels and the ground truth <coughs> rather than <coughs> someone's list of ingredients which may or may not be accurate. And as you know, there's probably at least, you know, it's a very under-constrained problem. There's probably 50 different ways you could cook a meal that looks exactly like that. Some of them, you know, if there were a scallop in there, you probably wouldn't see it. You would just have, you know, a chicken-like object, and so being able to recognize that that might contain scallop is a super, super difficult problem. And so if you're able to do much better, much finer brain or molecular level analysis or include more than just an image, you can make this go much further. So that, you know, if you were able to include odor or, you know, if you have um, new phones now have infrared sensors, and so maybe you could do some things with these kind of tools. But that, you know, we start off with the simpler problem first, but of course this has unlimited potential to keep you busy. Um, so if you click on this one, um, you get then sort of a similar notebook. And what we have is we sort of have these common allergens, and then we have how they map to different ingredients. So we see the eggs. You know, cow's milk sort of maps to cheese, butter, margarine, yogurt, cream, ice cream. And so basically, any recipe that contains any of those words, we give it a positive for cow's milk. Eggs is quite simple, but tree nuts is then Brazil nut, almond, cashew, macadamia nut, pistachio, pine nut, walnut, and potentially even more. I'm not sure if there are more tree nuts than that. Peanuts, quite easy. Shellfish, you have to do shrimp, prawn, crayfish, lobster, squid, scallops. Yeah, I, I think she made a really nice point. So how would you deal that with the misspelling? Let's take yogurt for example. I don't even know how to write yogurt right in German these days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what you, the easiest thing to do is probably think of the five most common misspellings and put them in. Yeah. Um, and say if any of those show up, it's probably something that you don't, that it probably has cow's milk in it. Um, you can then go even further to sort of the, um, I don't know if anyone's done sort of genomics or bioinformatics projects. So what they do is they do sort of like sequence to sequence comparison. So if you look at genetic code, you then say like how many mutations does it take to get between yogurt and the word that I have. And if it's, you know, fewer than two mutations, then it's probably yogurt. Um, that then gets very, very, very time consuming because each possible word that comes up, you have to do this kind of sequence analysis for. But in many cases, it makes sense. So actually, when we were working in hospitals, when we were trying to match medical records together, we had sort of this two mutation search for people's names because names got manually entered by secretaries and there were often typos. And so you want to make sure you were able to match the right people, and then you'd have to go through and try to filter by birthday or other information to get them the same. I mean, even things that aren't typos, um, like in Basel, they don't have support for French characters in their medical system. And in Geneva, they don't have support for German characters in their medical system. So you'd have like umlaut or u as ue or u or other things entirely. And so having this sort of mutation search was quite important to actually match those things up. Hopefully with food, it's a little bit easier, but yeah, I guess with yogurt. Yeah, I mean, I think the English spelling of yogurt is pretty clear. No, also not. <laughs> but it's never with a J. No, but it's like the G-H or Y-O-D. Oh, right. Yeah. 
So British, British piano. <coughs> they do. Okay. So potentially you can edit this and try to see how how well that works. So with this notebook, you can do the same thing, where you do um, copy and edit, and then you can run it yourself, and you can try to change what criteria you have for including different categories in your food. Yep. So it's possible to kind of optimize that kind of, to be able to find kind of data sets that gives you kind of connect car milk to any kind of food product that contains car milk. You probably you could know? find other data sets that do that. Um, is it known for entry for that? I mean, with this, if it's sort of like a list of 20 things, yeah. probably entering it by hand is quicker. Once it gets to be thousands and thousands of things. And what's quite nice about this is that having cheese there, we'll go to that a little bit later, we'll cover blue cheese. And just if the word cheese shows up, then you count it as cow's milk. And so you probably will get some false positives with that, because if you have, you know, cheese whiz that has cheese in it, but doesn't contain, as far as I know, any dairy part, that's cheese in a can in the US, um, but is there's, not really cheese. That's called bog based cheese or something. Yeah. And so if it was a soya cheese or something else, then that would get counted as cow's milk, even though it didn't have cow's milk in it. And so if you were, um, with this, it's quite easy to just manually say, if cheese shows up anywhere, we say cow's milk. Uh, but obviously for refining this, or if you actually wanted to make an app, I mean, of course this app you would never want to make because if someone took a picture and it said, no, there's no cow's milk, and they then eat it and die, <laughs> That's a quite dramatic consequence. You wouldn't ever really want to release something like this unless you were really, really, really confident that it was able to find even like traces or small amounts of certain things. But it seemed like an interesting enough problem to kind of start working on. And so here we sort of, you know, this is one of the ways you can kind of incorporate your expertise into models that you're able to give it this link between sort of the labels that you find in the data set and what you're actually trying to do. You know, particularly when you're using labels that come from the internet, they're very often not aligned with your exact task. And so you have to sort of find some kind of mapping with what you're doing. And um, an example of this is, you know, Instagram and Facebook take all of your photos, you knew that anyways, and train models with them. And they use the hashtags in your photos as labels for what's going on in that image. So the description itself isn't very helpful for them, but if you said like hashtag outdoor adventure, that's a quite useful label for that image. And so they're able to take that and use that to actually try to train a model to understand what's going on in these scenes better. So here we can sort of, uh, you can click run all, which might be the easiest thing to do. Um, these error messages, are because something in TensorFlow got updated, so don't worry about them. They should go away, and they probably won't show up on your computer, they just show up on Kaggle. And so here, this is where we sort of have kind of the manual um, inspection, that like if we look for all the things that we have, you know, what are the things that match to cow milk? So, you know, of the 494, different ingredients on our total ingredient list, the ones that match to cow milk, sort of are three packages of cream cheese, Bailey's Irish cream, low sodium cheddar cheese. So all of those seem quite reasonable. We see for eggs, um, 61. And can you figure out why the first one matched or what we might have done wrong? Or how do you think? Yeah? Exactly. And so because our thing looks for egg, <laughs> it finds veggies as egg, which is not an egg. <laughs> and so it's mapping a lot of these very vegetarian ingredients to things that are definitely not egg products. And so how would you fix that? Or what would you try to do? Exactly. 
So if you so if you go up here, you can change this to space egg, and then it will only match things. Hopefully, I actually haven't tested that, but in principle, it should only then show things. Yep. So by adding that space in front, we sort of force it. It has to be something that starts with the space. But then crumbled egg, if they write together, they would not. Then it wouldn't get found, right? Yeah. So hopefully they don't write scrambled eggs together. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's probably lots of dishes that have egg yeah. in them that have it written together or you know, free range <coughs> eggs. You might have a dash between range and eggs. Or, I mean, so there, there's never going to be a perfect solution that will get everything ideally mapped. And you also kind of have to decide what your trade-off is. Would you rather find too many egg products and have sort of a false alarm come up? Or would you rather have too few? And if you see an egg, you're really quite confident that that's what you sort of found. And so it obviously depends a lot on what you're trying to do with the application. But if you have an application that every time veggies are in something, it says egg, people probably wouldn't use it very much. And so we can kind of go through these categories and quickly decide, you know, has it been able to solve the problem well? That, you know, most of these categories look fairly reasonable. You can also print out more than three to get a better feeling for what's going on. But that you can sort of see, okay, most of these worked well enough. And then we can see, you know, for cow's milk, there's 3,000 recipes that have no <coughs> entries in cow's milk, 3,500 that have one, 1,600 that have two, 500 that have three, and there's one recipe that has eight different cow's milk ingredients in it, <laughs> which is then quite impressive. Um, and then we have sort of the same thing for eggs and these other ones, but it just gives us an idea of how frequently do these things sort of come together and what's the balance between the groups that you see? We have 9,500 examples that have no eggs and 112 that do. And so that's a very unbalanced group, so that will be a problem for us potentially later. And so here, we can so show, sort of show the number of items in each category, and you can see that the eggs is already much smaller than it used to be. And so from eggs and fish, we both have very, very small, not very many examples included. And so if you were using this to build a project, you'd probably want to now go get more examples of recipes that had eggs and fish in them so that you didn't have such a skewed data set. Because if you only have 10 example pictures with eggs and fish, it's going to be really difficult to have a model be able to figure out what aspects of that image were able to tell you that eggs and fish were present. And so, yeah, we can. Now we can kind of check our model here where we see, you know, a bunch of different recipes and below it all of the ingredients that it was able to identify that are possible allergens inside of it. And so we see here, you know, healthy pumpkin pie just has eggs in it. I would think it probably has some sort of cow's milk as well but maybe there are recipes that don't have it. You know, buttercream ice cream has cow's milk, that's quite easy. You know, the healthy granola clusters, cow's milk, eggs, tree nuts, wheat, that also sort of makes sense. So that you can go through these and sort of decide if these labels also look reasonable. So you can go through a few dozen of these images and see, does this match up with what you'd expect? Um, And so you could see that maybe your labels work really well for a certain task, but when you go to a different task, they might work much, much poorly or much, much worse. And so your ingredients list might be bad, but it could be useful enough for this allergen mapping, or it could be the other way around where your ingredients list is really good, but your allergen mapping is really bad.
Are there breaks planned? How is that? Are there any delays? Are there any delays? Okay, that works. Yeah, no, 10 o'clock is fine. I mean, we can stop at any point. It's just more of us when people are going to start to choose bathrooms and stuff. Um, so now the sort of collecting data part comes in. So we have sort of our data sources, and this is sort of what data is already available or what data do we have access to. And the collecting data is kind of how do we get more data and how do we put these data sets together. Um, so, you know, this does overlap quite a bit with sort of you know, the scientific method and how you're typically doing projects, but it's much more focused on that machine learning task. And so here, you know, you could try to find new data sets, so you could contact new websites that had recipes or maybe cookbook companies to try to get the data sets from them. <coughs> you could pay people to label data sets. So there's a service called Mechanical Turk from Amazon, which quite a few groups use, where you can basically pay someone one cent per image to mark if it has um, you know, uh, any of these allergens in it. And what do you think might be a problem with this, besides, of course, the whole ethical dilemma of underpaying people in poor countries to do mm -hmm. manual labor tasks? You can write codes, but if you're writing codes that automatically label your data, then the model you build is only going to be as good as the code you wrote. You don't, you don't really care about if it's doing right or wrong. You just write the code and just hope something comes out. Right. So that people game the system quite easily. And so if you set up a task and you're just like, say what allergens are in this picture, they might just say none, next, none, next, none, next, none, next, and get through thousands of pictures an hour and actually not give you any useful information. Um, so that's sort of the biggest problem with paying people to label it which is why most professors have their PhD students labeled it, because they're much more motivated, and if they do a really bad job labeling the data, then they'll probably have a really bad thesis at the end. Um, you can also pay people to label it and do sort of quality control and only pay people if they're able to label data that you already know the labels for really well, but it still becomes very tricky. And as you can see with a lot of these images, there's not necessarily, I mean, if you look at those examples we had back here, <laughs> determining if there's wheat in that soup is incredibly difficult. Even an expert trained person would probably struggle to say if that soup has wheat in it or not. Or if there's tree, I guess you see the pine nuts there, but if you didn't happen to see the pine nuts in it, it would be very difficult to say that pine nuts were actually present. And so that's also part of the task that you have to collect feedback from users. And so that when you're having people actually label all these data sets for you, you want to be asking them what images are hard, what tasks do you struggle with? Because again, if your labelers aren't able to make reasonable labels, then probably you're not going to get useful data out of your data set. So you're saying that trying to create an incentive for the labeler is the best way to like recapture. Well, with recapture, you sort of already have to kind of know the answer, okay. right? Or part of it you have to know the answer to, part of it you get information from. Because if you completely trust the recapture person, they just click nothing and click next. Okay. And so Google knows there's something you have to do. And then they compare you with lots of different people and kind of see if your results are good. And so there's tricks for doing this really efficiently. But you have to think about it. Just making a recapture and having people do it might lead to really poor results. And the other problem with recapture is you don't really get any feedback from them. So you want to know what labels did they struggle with, which ones are they really confident about, which ones are they really unconfident about, and how do you match that all together. And so that's where these tasks become quite interesting because it's not just you know, these binary on-off labels, but a lot of these things are, well, it might have it in there, or it could have this, or these images are really hard to tell, maybe you need to take it from a different angle, or maybe the person, you need a video of them like scraping through it so you can see a few more layers, or you can find out a lot of problems with your sort of problem definition by dealing with the labelers directly. 
and the labels, do they also get like you said the Google swap the picture with the tag yeah. hashtag? Do they also get this hashtag information or because that um, might help them to identify what is this dish? You know? Yeah. Yeah, so you could potentially give them the text, yeah. but ultimately you want to have a model that can just take an image and spit yeah. out what it is or what allergens might be inside it. And so you don't necessarily want to train your things with different information than you're going to have when you actually run it. Mm -hmm. So that sort of comes with this um, making predictions and offline evaluation part, where what <coughs> information are you actually going to have when your user is running your model in the real world. So it's possible to get tons of other tags and labels and the name of the item and what the ingredients are or what the cooking instructions are. But in the real world, you're not gonna have access to any of that because you're just an app running on your phone. And so you probably wanna limit yourself to what tools you have available at the time you're actually running the model. But yeah, I think clearly for this problem, having some way of entering this is what the name of the item was, would be massively helpful, but isn't really an image task, so I left it out of this. But clearly you could make this much better by including that text or including some of the keywords that show up and trying to improve the model even more. Because at the same time, they probably can correct if they see this non-orange juice labeled as orange juice, yeah. they can already correct those wrong yeah. images. Yeah. So a lot of times what you do is you take those data that you get from Google Images yeah. and then you give them to labelers to have them give you real high quality labels for them. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of times you have to have multiple people do the same image yeah. and then like take the average or the most common or the best result between all of them in order to get the yeah. final output. But there's not very many perfect solutions to this problem because you can have bad labels, bad images, and bad labelers. And so knowing which one you have is quite difficult. And yeah, in medicine they do this quite frequently. It's sort of called crowdsourcing, where they'll have like an imaging data set and people will label it. And you'll find you have a huge number of people who show off the website as like a demo and just randomly click and then click submit. And then it gets put in your data set as you know the tumor is here, 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 and here which doesn't make any sense, but is part of the data. So you just have to spend a lot of time filtering out what actually is good results and what are people just like playing around or demoing or testing other things out. Um, so the next part, um, which I think, yeah, will be sort of the last section we cover before lunch, is this idea with features. And so what features are are really where your domain knowledge becomes sort of the most useful. And so this is where we try to take, rather than putting in giant whole images into our model, we try to focus on specific aspects that might be useful for making these characterizations. And so, you know, if you were to take the image, like the brightness of the image probably doesn't affect anything. So you'd want to leave the brightness information out completely. But the color information, shape information, and patterns could be very useful. You know, if you see something that has uh, lots of yellow and brown in it, there's probably wheat in it somewhere. And so by just taking sort of the average colors, you can kind of start coming up with the first reasonable model, and then you can move beyond that to shapes and patterns and future steps. So the next thing we'll have is this sort of image to features. <coughs> longer to load this one, <coughs> but we have sort of the same introduction libraries that we have in all of them. You know, these aren't that important, but of course if you don't run them, nothing works afterwards. And so here we load up the recipes like we did before. We get the same weird error message. And we see that we have 9,653 recipe pairs loaded. And so we simplify our data and just keep the name, the image path, the title, and the top ingredients. 
and then we show a few examples because it's always helpful to kind of show a few of the things you're putting in to make sure you're doing the analysis on the right sort of things. And so here we show each ingredient as sort of a separate line and we see how well the images match up just like we did before. And so now what we do is we sort of create color features. <coughs> and so here we have sort of our test image. And what we want to do is we have sort of eight or 24 bit color images. So we have eight bits, so two to the eighth, and three channels, so red, green, and blue in each image which means there are 16 million different colors, which is a lot of different colors to keep track of and very different to compare. So if you were to look at, you know, color 8,520 and 8,521, they probably look almost identical to your eye and you can't really tell the difference between them. So one of the things we can do to make this easier is sort of take this trick that they used in the early internet and kind of convert it to a GIF format, which then only has 255 colors, and then turn it back. And so we get rid of the huge range of colors and the image looks mostly the same. And so here we have the original image and there we have sort of the low quality 1995 internet image. And there's many fewer colors present in it and so we can show the unique colors before was, you know, 10 million, and the unique colors afterwards was 108. So it now gives us a much smaller list of colors to work with so that we can start counting how often each color shows up and using that as a feature for building our models. So we see in sort of the, the histogram approach, this is what our original image looked like. So you have between 0 and 255 for red, green, and blue. And you can have all these sort of interesting different distributions. And now, with the animated GIF version, you just have these you know, five peaks that show up for each one of those color levels. But you still are able to quite easily tell what's in the image from those colors. So it massively shrinks the amount of information you have to deal with. Um, so now what we can do is we can sort of color that histogram. So we have between 0 and 255, and we show each bar by what color that represents in the image. So we see the ordering for that is a bit funny. We don't have to worry about that. But the, the colors that show up, we have a lot of different greens that show up. We have some purples, some whiter colors, and some sort of... Um, Sort of yellowish browns. Yep. Those colors come from the background. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, that means to separate versus separate. We background. could try to do that, but that's incredibly difficult to do. So the task of sort of figuring out what's in the foreground and what's in the background is very tricky. So that's what Apple and Google have done in their sort of latest phones. But even then, they have two lenses which are able to sort of have different focal lengths and separate the background from the foreground quite nicely. So if your background is blurred, maybe it's a little bit easier. But if you're taking it with a normal phone, then the background probably won't be blurred. And so if you could label the foreground and background, that would be, make your problem a lot simpler. But it's very difficult to solve that problem. And so it makes your whole task a lot more complicated if you have to try to segment. But if you have those labels, or if you could have someone crop the image to where's the relevant feature of interest, that would be very useful. Because yeah, clearly, you know, if you have cereal and green bowls, then it's going to learn that green bowls mean wheat. <laughs> and of course, green bowls have nothing to do with it. So yeah, so that's probably the by far biggest problem with this method, is you're taking a summary of the image and trying to pick out a single individual feature from that summary. But this was just the easiest kind of feature vector you can come up with as a very, very first approach. And what it serves well for is this idea of having a baseline model. 
And so basically, if you take this feature and you plug it into a really simple model, any more complicated model should easily be able to do much, much better. And so this gives you kind of a reference point so that like the dumbest model you could possibly come up with would be taking these 255 colors and trying to predict the food that comes out. And hopefully your model learns things like purple isn't really that important of a color. Probably green as well. And it hopefully will start to learn that you know, if you have lots of these whites in your image, maybe that's milk, or that that indicates milk comes up more frequently. But um, this is always a quite important step, because if you don't make the simplest, dumbest model you can, then you have no idea if your super complicated approach works better or not. And I mean, one of the examples I have personally of this, there's this contest where you can um, classify digits. They have it for check writing, so they want to be able to recognize handwritten digits between zero and nine. And if you use just the pixels themselves and put it into a random forest, you get 99.99% accuracy. And if you, I built a model <coughs> where you take the image, you turn it into a graph, you look at the connectivity between the different nodes, and you store that connectivity matrix, and you use that to label the digit, and it was 60% accurate. And so my complicated, fancy method was 39% less accurate than a stupid random forest where you just put it in that was one line of code. And so it's very important to have that kind of baseline to know if you're actually making an improvement or if you have a super complicated model that doesn't actually solve your problem. And particularly with machine learning, it's very easy to build models to do anything. It doesn't necessarily mean that they learned the important parts of the image. And so taking something like this as a fairly simple one is a very useful starting point, even if it doesn't necessarily lead to the right answer. I guess if you're early on the procedure, you can make a selection like saying, okay, I throw out the images, or let's say the food is only a small portion of the image, so I think this is a good selection to put in. Exactly. Like with a link. Yeah. So with this, you could quite easily take, you could take this, build a model, and see which images were the biggest outliers or had the worst predictions, and then throw all of them away. And so that would maybe help you clean up your data set to only a smaller subset where the colors really corresponded with what you were looking for. So a lot of these things are quite helpful. And as we see down here, so we see the raw color counts. So these are the colors between 0 and 255. And then our images don't really take up most of the space. So each one of these <coughs> rows is an image, and the intensity sort of shows how strong that color is in the image. And what you see is that most of the colors actually never show up. So that all of our images have these kind of same band of colors. And so we picked 255 colors that were good for web pages, but actually a lot of the colors we never end up using at all. Um, so yeah, one of the useful things you can do um, is called principal component analysis. And I won't really get into detail with that, but basically you can take this feature vector you put in, or you've created with all the colors, and put it into principal components, which basically finds you know, the two biggest explainers of variance in your data set. And so what it allows you to do is take all of your images and plot them on a chart where you can kind of see how they're arranged. So what separations are you easily able to find? And here we plot it with the title, which isn't particularly helpful. I guess you could start to see chocolate, happy birthday, well, maybe desserts come up there, cottage cheese, spicy cheese come over there a bit, but it's not very useful. And so we can do this other plot, which now lets us kind of see how those images are divided up. And so we can kind of see that, you know, if it has a white background, it shows up in that corner. If it has lots of, you know, sort of yellows and browns, it shows up over here. And what are the top ones? I guess more colorful. Yeah. 
And so it lets you sort of see what has our feature vector managed to capture in our images. And that it probably has done a much better job of capturing the background than the foreground, it's quite clear. But at, at least you would think for maybe wheat it would work fairly well. Although if you could tell from this, the difference between wheat and cheese might be a bit tricky. <laughs> we can then do an even fancier representation called TSNE, um, which you shouldn't worry about what that means. But it basically tries to make a better, it's like a very smart version of PCA, which tries to plot the images a little more reasonably and combine more of the information together. So here, we see that we have, so this one doesn't have quite as clear trends in it, but frequently this plot looks much better, and when you have simpler images, it's also easier to kind of tell what's going on. I think because a lot of them are sort of packed towards the center, it's a little bit tricky. But if you, Yeah, so this is like an example of like the written digits where that plot kind of gives you different islands. And where it's really helpful is it shows you what things are probably likely to be confused. So as most of you have written most of your life, you probably could have guessed, but like four and nine are coming from the same region, which means a model would probably have trouble identifying always the difference between four and nine, but between four and three is super easy. And so having a plot like this can make it easier to figure out where your models might fail. What you see as well with sort of seven and one, they're very close, zero is separated from everything very well. Eight and five have some very bizarre overlaps. So they could be quite tricky to separate. And then this kind of five and this six also could be quite tricky. So you kind of tap, can easy, more easily see what will be problems by making little charts like this because you can see what things kind of are too close together and become problematic. From our food images, we don't quite see that as well. But we get at least an idea. We see probably green things tendentially come over there yellow thing sort of in the middle, but it's clearly not super simple for everything. But really the, the basic assumption is that the roots of the new images uh, orient towards the color cell, so because you can, you can also have, let's say, a color identified which color-wise is out of the range. Yeah. So what do we look at it? You assume that's, that's uh, the differentiation of the roots of the right. goes along with the colors. If, if this is not the case, so if, if you have images or sources which make the colors in different areas right. of the spectra, so you can mix it up. Right. So with this, we, we did the simplest one, which was just saying the color. Because, you know, that was, for me at least, the most obvious thing to look at, and actually the easiest thing to quantify. So quantifying a carrot by its shape you could do, but would be very then tricky to figure out how would you quantify cow's milk by shape, like, or pattern. So you can come up with it. There are potentially ways of doing it, but it's then really difficult to like write a simple rule for that, and how would that look different from eggs, or how would that look different from the other ones? And so, you know, a lot of things, you know, you probably, as a human, could solve this problem very well with black and white images, or grayscale images because you could sort of see the same things. But the colors, for me, seemed like the easiest starting point for coming up with a little baseline. But clearly, combining colors and shapes and patterns would get you a lot further. But, you know, bread has you know, a number of fairly common patterns, so if you see that pattern somewhere in your image, it's probably bread. Pasta is probably the same way. But trying to come up with something to quantify pasta likeness in an image is then super tricky. But yeah, no, this was, this was meant to be a very, very simple starting point where it would be easy enough to see what the features actually mean. So that you have this color ID, and each one of the values is basically how many pixels have that color. 
And it's also quite nice because no matter how big your image is, you still have the same output color pattern. And so with a lot of other features in images, if you have a larger image or a smaller image, your feature would get larger and smaller, which then makes it very difficult to compare. And so I think we can take a break there, or if there's questions on that. Just one question. Yeah. Would, it, would it be a good strategy to say I have kind of a, a pre-state kind of uh, calibrating my, my system towards the criteria which I want to later on specify in further detail? Like saying uh, parents can have a color spectrum from here to here. I know what I want no. to do from color. And, and read the milk and so forth. Uh, so if I kind of connect the identification of the, of the, of the object or the product, with a color spectrum. Yeah. So you could, so what we do right here is basically just take the whole color spectrum for everything. Yeah. But what you could do is you could say, I know pink, for example, is always irrelevant. So I want to delete, I don't want that color ever to play a role in my model and say, I always want to remove pink. And you could then say, actually, I can group up my colors into like greens and yellows and those. And that these are the exact yellow colors I want. These are the exact green colors I want because I know they're important for that product. Where it gets them more difficult is if you want to do something sort of between here and the <coughs> output, which is then much trickier. But you could have sort of checks. that You could go back and say, what is my model actually doing? Is it responding to the right colors or not? And so it's, it tends to be more useful as sort of a diagnostic where you go back and look at your model and say, how is it making this decision? You know, if I change the colors, the carrots color to blue, do I get a completely different result out or not? And that as sort of a way of testing it. But you can also incorporate them in the forward direction, but it gets a little trickier to do that by. But these are all the areas where you're sort of expertise about what you're doing because your model doesn't know anything. Your model just takes in data and spits out results doesn't care what carrots are or what anything else, it's just little labels. And so if you can make these features or these inputs smarter and better, it makes your problem significantly easier to solve. But yeah, with this we picked really the simplest feature we could do because a lot of the other features require, unfortunately, a lot of explanation and don't necessarily solve your problem either. I mean, that if you do, you know, two-point correlation matrices, you can come up with all these complicated texture functions, and you might improve your model by 5%. But you've increased the work and computation and complexity by a factor of 100. And so there's always that trade-off of, you know, with the color one, you know exactly what each input means, and with the other ones, it becomes a lot more difficult to kind of understand how that would affect. Any other question? Yeah? Good time. How long? 15 minutes? Yeah, 15 minutes.